thank you for the introduction. And well, it's a slightly kind of melancholy privilege to speak uh, at a conference in um, in memory of Jan Nekova. So uh, meeting and talking with Jan was always one of the pleasures of coming to Paris, and I miss him. And well, I. Uh, so I've been giving um, several talks in, in Europe in the last couple of months and uh, I've tried to make them all different and so I wanted this to be a different talk again and uh, at least something that uh, maybe connects to, uh, to, to some of Jan's interests. And so I wanted to say a little bit about uh, well eigenvarieties from the point of view of uh, piadic representation theory. And, well, so that's a topic that I began thinking about more than 20 years ago. And when I started, eigenvarieties were relatively new and piadic representation theory was also very new. And it wasn't so hard to give a talk on connecting the two because almost any connection you made was, was also relatively new. Um, and the situation has changed a lot now. And uh, kind of in preparing this talk, or trying to prepare this talk, I uh, well, I realized that I'm so I'm certainly not going to be able to give anything like a comprehensive talk on on uh, eigenvarieties and representation theory of piadic groups, but I want to um, maybe highlight a few kind of things that I find interesting that are, as far as I know, not sort of completely understood and stu and maybe not kind of comprehensively studied yet, and. Um, well, some of you know I, I hate writing on the board and I, and I don't like notation on the board in talks. And, uh, well, representation theory and eigenvarieties can both be subjects that are fairly heavy in notation. And one way to avoid that is to, say, talk about the group GL2 and talk about a curve. And so probably the eigenvarieties I'll mainly focus on will be, will be the eigencurve and... Uh, and then also an eigensurface. And so let me start with the eigencurve. Just very uh, roughly, this is a family of what are called overconvergent chaotic modular forms of finite slope. And it's sort of, uh, so the attribution here is probably to Coleman and Mesa, although many other people also worked on sort of extending the theory away from level one and things like this. And one of the, one of the kind of aspects of, the, um, of this kind of statement is that uh, I'm writing family. Uh, and so in the theory of piadic modular forms, I mean, it's a theory that evolved somewhat organically over some decades. And so it wasn't, didn't commence with a kind of overarching definition. And um, so people, uh, especially sort of in, um, say, Uesawa theory and areas that kind of apply the theory of piadic modular forms, you'll often talk about a common families, hitter families. But the sort of Eigen curve is supposed to be the kind of overarching family of which any other family that people are talking about is some some piece, maybe some open neighborhood. And the um, and the a key feature, as everybody here knows, is that these overconvergent modular forms are or the sort of piatic families of piatic modular forms kind of be can be parameterized by the weight. Um, so uh, The first thing I want to talk about is what is finite slope. And so finite slope is the following thing that, again, as everybody here knows, that on classical modular forms, if you have, uh, if you're on gamma zero p or gamma one p or gamma one, a power of p, you have the up operator you have this up operator and finite slope 
finite, finite slope is uh, a non-zero, well, sorry, a, a modular form has finite slope if it's an eigenvector with a non-zero eigenvalue for up. And um, so this is a sort of a, a fairly natural uh, condition. Um, certainly one way you achieve it is if you take a modular form of level prime to p and then you think of it as giving you an old form at level p, then when you act up on it, that won't preserve that old form, but you'll end up getting a two-dimensional space of old forms and you can diagonalize up on them and you get two finite slope forms. And so it's easy to produce such objects. Um, but this finite slope condition is a bit um, irritating from another perspective because it's not a really representation theoretic condition. And so, in representation theory, this modular form F becomes a representation of GL2QP. Or rather, it generates representation of GL2QP. And F itself, suppose that F was a classical modular form which had uh, where the level at P is gamma 0 P, then when we think of F as generating a smooth representation of pi P, F is uh, giving you an Iwahori uh, fixed vector. Um, so if if kind of in classical language f is on gamma zero p. Um, Well, here I'm imagining it's a classical modular form and it generates a smooth representation. And then if it's classically on, say, gamma zero p, then in this representation, f is literally a vector fixed by Iwahori. Um, but Sorry. If f is classically on gamma 1p to the n, then uh, f is some vector in this pi p, and it will be fixed by this uh, subgroup, just because gamma 1p to the n consists of upper triangular matrices. And uh, and and what is UP? kind of acts in the following way. Um, so let me call this group N0. So if you conjugate N0 by the matrix P001, you get this subgroup of N0, and so let's call it N0 prime. So the action of this matrix P001 identifies these invariants, and then we can map back to the N0 invariants by summing over the cosets so, so by something over the cosets of this group in this group, which would be 
during this sum. You can, you could, I mean, you can sum, you can also average, I mean, you could divide by p because they're p cosets, and uh, doesn't matter so much representation theoretically. Traditionally, people just do a sum without doing a division. And this composite is what's called up. And um, and sort of so looking for finite slope forms is looking for elements here where up acts non -zero, in a non-zero way. Um, but one thing that's slightly irritating when you try and com compare classical theory to representation theory is that the f that you choose, I mean, the, the classical f that you work with are either new, they're typically so-called new forms and are What do I want to say? I want to say that uh, so you're you're in, you're fixed by this bigger group if f is a new form or possibly a p-stabilized. If you're a new form or if you're a p-stabilized new form, then you're fixed by this group. And that group, zp star zp01, is not very representation theoretically uh, nice to talk about because it breaks the symmetry in the torus. There's no, somehow representation theoretically, there's no particular reason to choose one zp star in the diagonal torus and not another. So, uh, so being fixed by this thing is not so, talking about this object is not so great. It doesn't generalize so well to other groups. Talking about this object, which is just the ZP points of the unipotent radical of the Borel, makes kind of perfect sense, basically, for any group. And so, um, and so, we, can, so we can talk about uh, finite slope elements of pi p as being the elements in here where up acts with a non-zero eigenvector. And uh, we then have, so, so the up action on pi p and naught has finite slope, has uh, you know, non-zero finite slope eigenvectors if and only if uh, two things happen, pi p is principal series, unramified or ramified, or if pi p is a twist Steinberg. And so, and so the condition of um, kind of uh, sort of if you basically uh, forget about thinking precisely about new forms, but just think about finite slope vectors in the representation pi p, then, then the kind of condition of finite slope, which is being parameterized, which, which is what Coleman and Mazur studied when they made the Eigen curve, has a pretty nice representation theoretic interpretation. It's just asking that the local factor at p be a principal series or a Steinberg, which is some kind of degenerate limit of principal series, some kind of degenerate version of a principal series. And in this case, the uh, there are two finite slope eigenspaces. So the space of finite slope vectors is kind of two-dimensional. And here there is uh, one Eigenspace. One finite slope eigenspace. So, in the formula for UP you just started with, why, why, uh, why you don't have a sum? I mean, you, then you say another thing with a sum of a coset, P coset, or, or P minus. I mean, okay, so why, why the formula is not, doesn't seem to, to reflect, uh, I'm not sure. The formula is just, 
Okay, maybe if one works it out, one gets this formula or... So, I th it's, um, I guess it's just, what is a, what is a Hecker operator? So, so if you, uh, the idea of a Hecker operator, I think, is that suppose you had a group G and you had, uh, so, so, so for me the group would be, say, GL2, but suppose that more abstractly you had a representation of a group G and you had a f normal subgroup H. Then if you took the H invariance, G mod H would act on the H invariance. So now, when we have, when we have um, something like uh, this N0, it's not normal inside, of course, it's not normal inside GL2QP, but it's kind of virtually normalized by P001, meaning that when you conjugate by P001, you get something, a finite index inside what you started with. So then you can't, so there's no quotient group that will act, but you can still kind of act P001, and now you're invariant under this conjugate, under this conjugate, and now you can just, because you have finite index, you can kind of average over the cosets to get back where you started. And so it's almost like having an action of the group P001. But it's not, that's, uh, so that's sort of a heck, what a heck operator is. It's, so um, the formula, I'm asking about the formula. So the formula for this, the Q expansion. Up here? Up here? Yeah. Ah, so well, this formula will be... Um, this is on classical forms or on, or on... Yeah, so this will be, this will come from... I mean, you have, to you have to sort of go through a conversion that converts your classical form and you have to figure out how GL2QP acts, but it will give you that formula. Yeah, I, I don't think I want to try and repeat the comp computation on the board, but it will give you that formula. Um, well, they always, they could, they could always be kind of divisions by powers of P possibly happening because it depends how you normalize your GL2QP action. Um, so, so, uh, so one, one way to see this so the one way to think about this is that, as I was just saying, what are we, we doing when we uh, sort of take these n naught uh, invariants? We're sort of trying to take n naught invariants and then use the fact that the unipotent radical is kind of normalized by the diagonal torus to kind of make the diagonal torus act here. But of course, the, the non-compact direction, the torus, does not literally normalize this uh, integral unipotent radical, so you don't quite get a group action. Um, on the other hand, if you try to take uh, invariance under the QP points of the unipotent radical, you typically get zero. So, it's, so you, you don't get anything interesting if you take QP points. But you could take co-invariance under the unipotent, or under the QP points of the unipotent radical. And so if you take the invariance under N0, since this is a smooth representation and this is compact, this maps isomorphically to the co-invariance, which then subject onto this co-invariance. And then this UP operator here, up to, um, well, if we divide it by a power of P here, it would be literally true. So up to, some, up to maybe some power of P, this UP operator here, then maps to the action of uh, P001 here. So if you have a, um, well, and you have a theorem which is here due to Castleman, it's called the theorem of the canonical lift, tells you that in fact, if you take the finite slope eigenspaces for UP here, they map isomorphically 
to these n covariants. And these n covariants are exactly how you would map to a principal series. So a principal series is an induction from the Borel to GL2 of a character. And so hum from pi p to a principal series over GL2 is the same as hum over the Borel from pi p to the character. And since the character is trivial on the unipotent radical, this is the same as the hum from the n covariance to chi over the torus. And so having, so, so, this is, so this computation is why, combined with Castleman's theorem, is why this is true. Because of pi p that have finite slope elements are exactly the ones that can be mapped either isomorphically to a principal series or embedded, say, as a um, Steinberg inside a principal series. So, So, um, so, uh, so one can try to study eigenvarieties um, sort of using, using this um, more sort of principal series-like perspective. And so, So I want to explain. Well, so I want to kind of remind you how to get the eigen curve, or really, what I'll explain is the eigen surface via uh, by the local uh, jacking module. And so I should say that uh, I didn't write it. The, um, these sort of functors that are appearing in Castleman's theorem, well, the right-hand one, but then also the left-hand one, since they're isomorphic, this, this, so this n covariance is called the Jack A module of pi p, so called by Castleman based because of the way Jack A first used it. And so, so what we do is we start with the tower of modular curves. This is a modular curve of level of, of p power level. We take cohomology with coefficients mod a power of p. We take a direct limit over the uh, powers. And the, so this gives us, so this thing now has an action of G of, Q, G of 2 QP, which is smooth. Of course, we take then the inverse limit over S. So that gives us now essentially a unit ball in a piatic Banach space. That's the completed cohomology. So we start with that. We then can extend scalars to QP. So, so this, yeah, so the, so, so the way to think about it is that this guy, th this thing, looks basically like a countable direct sum of copies of Z mod P to the S, if, if you forget the representation. So this object looks like a countable sum of copies of ZP, but periodically completed. 
So that looks like a unit ball in a Banach space. And so when you tensor with QP, that's a piadic Banach space. So it's a piadic Banach space with an action of GL2 QP. You can then, inside there, take what are called the locally analytic vectors. And so the locally analytic vectors, what are they? If you have a, this uh, topological vector space with an action of this piadic group, then any particular vector, the piadic group acts and has an orbit. And so that gives you an, uh, and if it's a continuous action, which here it is, because it came from an action on the, on the lattice. So if this continuous action, you get the orbit gives you a continuous function from the group to the, to the Banach space. And you can try to improve, you can ask for that function to have better regularity. Like in a smooth representation, the orbits are actually locally constant on the group. So in this Banach space representation, most vectors won't be smooth, but you could ask that they be locally analytic functions on the group. And so that's this locally analytic guys. And uh, you can then take the uh, And then you can take the what I call the locally analytic JK module of this thing, which is by definition. So let's just maybe abbreviate this. I don't know how much to abbreviate it, but maybe we can abbreviate it to H1 tilde locally analytic. So you take these local linear vectors and you copy the left-hand side of, of the thing in Kasselman's theorem. So you take these invariants under N0 and then you take the finite slope part. And so, so this is a, um, so these locally analytic vectors, they're dense inside the Banach space, but you don't give them that topology. You give them, they kind of get their own topology, which makes them what's called a, uh, a, a kind of compact type locally convex space. So it's a kind of a dual to a nuclear space. So they, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural topology. And then we take these n not invariants, that's a closed condition. So this is some sort of natural, locally complete, locally convex space. And so when you take, when you want to do the spectral theory, this finite slope spectral theory, uh, you have to be a little careful how you talk about it, but it's essentially an application of the theory of compact operators. And so this thing becomes, well, what, what, what do you have an action of? Well, you kind of have this P001. And of course, the center commutes with everything I've written down. And so you have an action of the center of the group. And then also, um, the ZP points of the diagonal torus, they can't, they normalize this N0. And so the ZP, so the, so the upshot is the entire diagonal torus acts on this. And so this whole thing gets an action of, uh, of T of QP. So does QP star the diagonal torus inside GL2. And, um, but it's not, but since this object is rather large, it's not going to be a semi-simple action. And so how do you measure it? Well, so you can, so you can do a thing that's a bit irritating, but happens all the time in periodic functional analysis, which is, well, it's the same thing as in Iwasawa theory. In Iwasawa theory, sometimes you want to work with uh, kind of compact Iwasawa modules, finitely generated lambda modules, torsion lambda modules, and sometimes you want to work with co-torsion objects, discrete objects. And so, so here we have a similar thing. Um, we can dualize this so to obtain 
uh, periodic topological vector space M. But this M, it's a, it's a dual, it still has an action of this T of QP. But actually, this M now, well, well what is this M kind of doing? Well, so, so if you think about the spectral, if you're sort of trying to imagine the spectral theory of this object, you're thinking about characters of T and trying to see whether this object has an eigenspace for the various characters of T. Oh, yeah? You, you said that it were, I mean, at some point you said the, the word, the object is a real action of the whole torus. Yes. yes. And um, I'm sorry, I, I missed so how. It's clear. Yeah, it, how is that not obvious? No, it's, it is obvious, but you, you, you want to say it's important? Or I, 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 I had the impression I had missed. So well, I, th I think, well, I think the ZP star, ZP star part is obvious, and the central part is obvious. Yeah, okay. And the, but, but, the, but the P001 is UP. Okay, okay, so... Yeah. Um, but so... So... Uh, a chi eigenspace in this object will correspond to uh, a chi eigen quotient in this object M just by duality. And so in fact, this M is a coherent sheaf over this T hat, which is by definition the space of continuous characters chi of this T of QP. Not exactly. No? Yeah. So so this M, yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll come to it in a sec. But so this M lives over this uh, space of characters of the torus. So what does the space of characters of the torus look like? Well, it, it's a product of two copies of the space of characters of QP star. And a character of QP star, you have to give a character on ZP star. That's the common Mazer weight space. And you have to give a character of just powers of P. That's just a non-zero number. So this guy looks like a non-zero number, cross weight space. And then, because there are two copies of QP star, you get two such things. So again, if, if we sort of were in, um, if you're doing the sort of Eigen curve, you're more or less ignoring one of these QP stars. And then you're kind of really working over just this. And here's your weight, and here's your UP eigenvalue. And so, um, yeah, so, so there's kind of one of the first main theorems in this construction is that, in fact, this guy is naturally a coherent sheaf over this space. And so in particular, the, um, the eigenspaces for any particular character are the fibers of this coherent sheaf over a particular character. And, and since it's a coherent sheaf, they're finite dimensional. So, um, so, there's a, so it's a kind of geometric inter interpretation of the output of some compact operator theory. And oh, what is W? Sorry, W is the usual Coleman Mazer weight space, so the space of characters of ZP star. So it looks like um, uh, ZP star has a little root of unity part, and then it has one units, and so this W has connecting components labeled by characters of the root of unity, and then a character of the one units is just the characters of the one units are an open unit disk. So this looks like a finite number of copies of an open unit disk. Um, so, uh, so in um, in the theory of smooth representations, there's a famous result, which well, in general, is called Bernstein second adjointness 
For admissible representations, as goes, I mean, Bernstein himself kind of cites Castleman, for admissible smooth representations as due to Castleman, is connected to the formula up there that this uh, Jack A module is not only a left adjoint to parabolic induction, it's actually a right adjoint to parabolic induction. And that formula is partly how you prove it. And, um, and something is roughly true here. So if we look at this, uh, so let's just call this J. If we take this J, we can kind of locally and analytically induce. So this, this J is kind of a characters of, of the torus. So we can induce from the Borel to GL2QP J. And you get essentially a map, H1 tilde locally analytic. But this map is not defined on all of J. So I want to, um, so, so this is the main thing I want to talk about. So sorry, I mean, I know for a lot of people here, what I've said is like 20 years old. Um, but I wanted to get to, I want to get to this point because although this is much studied, I think there's sort of more interesting things to do. Um, and so, so first of all, what, so what is this M? Well, one thing that happens with this M or, or equivalently the J is of course, we also have a Hecker action we have a a prime to p Hecker action, and so, uh, so maybe I can write here. So M uh, is a coherent shift over this t hat, and its support on this t hat. Again, if I had a kind of somehow normalized away one copy of QP star, the support over this T hat will be what Coleman and Mazur called the spectral curve. So the kind of families of weights and UP eigenvalues, but that where you don't see the other heck operators. But we can, so let me write kind of bold face T for the Hecker algebra that acts on M. Then we can really kind of enhance M to a coherent sheaf over this t hat cross the, uh, so this is the algebra of prime to p heck operators. And now uh, the support of M over this object is, again, if I had sort of suppressed one copy of QP star will be the Eigen curve. What this is, it's the support is the so-called Eigen surface. So the Eigen surface is the common, you take the common major Eigen curve and then you allow yourself to twist by wild characters. So if you take a classical new form, this finite slope, and you twist it by a character that has P in the conductor, the coefficient of Q to the P will become zero because when you twist, if you have a modular form F and you twist by a character chi, the nth coefficient gets multiplied by chi of N. And if chi has conductor p, then the convention is that chi of p is zero. Or if chi has a p-power conductor, chi of p is zero. So twisting, destroy, twisting by characters of conductor p destroys the finite slope condition that Coleman and Mazur used. But it doesn't destroy this principal series condition. Or, or it doesn't destroy, so, so, sort of the reason it destroys the finite slope condition is if you twist a pi p and you take a finite slope vector in a pi p and, and you twist, you can kind of twist pi p, you can twist a finite slope vector, you'll get a finite slope vector in the twisted pi p. But in the twisted pi p, the if the finite slope vector was a new form in the original pi p, the twisted finite slope vector will not be a new form in the twisted pi p. And so if you ask for vectors that are simultaneously new form and finite slope, that's not a twist invariant concept. But if you don't care about new forms, it's a twist invariant concept. And so everything, so this can, all these constructions are twist invariant. And so this guy is supported on the Eigen surface, which is equal to kind of E, the Coleman Mazur Eigen curve, cross W, a space of wild twists. Um, 
And, uh, and so what happens is that you can, so you get this sort of uh, partial adjunction that lets you have this map. And this map is a lot like, it's a lot like the theory of Eisenstein series in classical automorphic forms. So in classical automorphic forms, you take the space of automorphic forms, you compute a constant term, which gives you a family of characters, so let's say it was GL2, you compute the constant term, which is a family of characters of the Borel. You can induce those constant terms to get a family of induced representations. And then the theory of Eisenstein series maps, Eisenstein series maps the induction of the constant term back to the automorphic forms, but that map can, is, is typically well defined, but it can have poles and zeros. And so the same thing happens here. So it's not, we're not doing a constant term, and we're not doing something, we're doing something kind of locally at P, but still we're, we're computing some sort of, uh, we're trying to do some kind of reduction from GL2 to the torus. We compute some family of characters of the torus, we can induce them, we try to map them back in. We get a map that's defined at kind of most points in the support of M but not everywhere. There can be poles and there can be zeros. And so studying these poles and zeros is a super interesting question. And so I, um, so I want to explain just a few things that, that ha sort of happen in this picture. Um, so I want to uh, just show what happens typically at a, at sort of a, a classical point. So at a classical point, we'll have, if we sort of start with a classical point, so a classical modular form that gives us a classical point on the eigencurve, we get uh, so if f is a classical finite slope new form, this gives a cat, or it gives a, um, let's say just a point chi part of M, which is locally dominant algebraic. So it's a character of the torus, which whose, um, whose derivative is a non-negative integer. So it's, so it's kind of a locally algebraic character of the torus, which is also dominant. And so, and so we get this map, the locally analytic induction from B to GL2 of that character mapping into H1 tilde. And inside here, you have the locally algebraic induction, you have the locally algebraic induction of chi which kind of makes sense because chi is dominant algebraic. And this locally algebraic induction is the pi p of f and then tensor some uh, sort of sim k minus 2 of qp squared. And so you get uh, this locally algebraic representation sitting inside here. So in weight two, you would just get the smooth representation. In higher weight, you get a locally algebraic representation. And you kind of recover, and that this is sort of the, the, rigid, the classical modular form sitting inside cohomology by eichler schmuller theory um, as kind of a part of this story. But there's, um, there's sort of an interesting case which is uh, if chi is actually algebraic, so chi is not just locally algebraic, but actually just an al algebraic. So when does that happen? So this is if
if the pi p for f is Steinberg. Then this local induction of chi contains this locally algebraic induction of chi, which contains actually the same k minus 2 of qp squared itself. Because the smooth representation, when you do a kind of induction, when you do the, the, the kind of parabolic induction that produces a Steinberg, you have a trivial as a sum. And so when you've tensored with the same k minus 2, you get this actual same k minus 2. And so, so this thing will be mapping to the h1 tilde. But when you restrict here, this map, the image is something finite dimensional inside h1 tilde. And we know that modular forms don't generate finite dimensional representations. And for example, and this is a little more argument, but you see this h1 tilde doesn't contain this finite dimensional representation. So this must be, this map must be zero. So that's an example of a zero of the Eisenstein series. And so what happens, so first of all, uh, sort of this, this object maps in. And so this object has, this has a name. It's what Christoph Roy called sigma k, or sigma k or sigma k minus 2. I, I can't promise the normalizations. But it's, it's a, um, it contains a kind of a, a sort of a Steinberg part. And then, uh, sorry, yeah. This is, this is sigma k. And then, but what happens is we're on, we don't just have this map kind of in isolation at this point. This point is in a family of points. It's on this surface. And, ag and again, I could just think about moving along the eigen curve. And so if we kind of move along the eigen curve. What will happen is, yeah, so what, what is the picture you have? You have a curve, and you have some kind of vector space. And so maybe here's a point we start at, and here's a very close point. Maybe, like eps maybe the epsilon neighborhood of this point. And here, and then here we have a representation, which has two tiers. I'm thinking about sort of uh, this tier and what comes next. And so if I kind of just move epsilon away, like uh, k brackets epsilon mod epsilon squared is filtered by just two copies of k. And so if I kind of push, if I kind of push just an epsilon neighborhood away, I'll get the same situation sort of pushed epsilon away. And I have this, this and I have my kind of, my kind of map into this h1 tilde. And and if th maybe, so this is landing in some eigenspace for f. And then this kind of column next to it is landing in the uh, thickened, a thickened eigenspace, a sort of a, an order two eigen, a generalized eigenspace of order two. But, but this piece actually maps to zero. So this piece actually has to land in the f eigenspace. So, so, be, so you essentially you have sort of something of length in this epsilon neighborhood. You have sort of something of length for the kind of algebraic, the sigma k, then the algebraic, then the sigma k, mapping into a generalized eigenspace in H1 tilde. But because the the bottom of the length four guy is mapping to zero, the piece that you think will be going into the generalized eigenspace has to go into the actual eigenspace. And so the actual eigenspace for this Steinberg for this kind of Steinberg modular form, so this is a, a form of a new form on gamma zero p, the actual eigenspace contains an extension the other way. It contains the sigma k as a sub and a sin k minus two is a quotient. And you can compute the extension class. You can compute the extension class because you just have to um, you just have to think about how you're just doing a local anything induction and just deforming this chi along the eigen curve. You just think about how the chi deforms. And so you discover the extension class is given by essentially, well, you're kind of moving through a GM and a W. So the, so the extension class is computed by the derivative of the UP eigenvalue with respect to the weight. 
And so that's the Greenberg-Stevens formula. And so, um, and so what I've just explained is an argument of Ewen Ding. So by analyzing the situation for this particular zero of the map, Ewen Ding kind of gives a kind of a representation theoretic proof of the Greenberg-Stevens formula. So the ex so the extension class in the eigenspace, the extension class of this gadget above the sigma k is the kind of L invariant, but you compute it as being a derivative of a UP eigenvalue with respect to a weight. And that's the Greenberg-Stevens formula. So, so that's kind of one example of how you sort of exploit a, a zero of this map. And you can also sort of think about poles. So, so when would this map have a pole? So when this map would have a pole, if we kind of look at the situation and we um, imagine when, sort of when, well, when, when would this kind of situation, when would, when would you, you, sorry, when would you get some tension in this kind of a situation? Well, the, the chi, Again, the chi is remembering a, a UP eigenvalue and a weight. And so to, for the chi to be locally dominant algebraic, that meant we had to be in, 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 the, in terms of weights of classical module forms, we had to be in weight at least two. But we know that on the eigencurve, there are points that correspond to non-classical modular forms that have classical weight. So you can produce a chi, which is a locally dominant algebraic chi, by choosing a non-classical modular, periodic modular form of, of classical weight. And then you, um, and then you have this situation, and then you have this map. And if this gadget we're mapping in, that non-classical modular form will be contributing some locally algebraic vectors to this H1 tilde. But it's not so hard to see those locally algebraic vectors all actually come from classical modular forms. And that will be a contradiction. And so, well, what you see is that there must be some kind of singularity at a, non -cla at a class form of classical weight, but, non but a non-classical form. You can't just have this, this kind of gadget mapping in, in a non-zero way. So, well, what happens, well, either there's a, there has to be some kind of singularity. So if there's a pole, you kind of multiply by a high enough power of, of a uniformizer to kill off the pole. And then what you find is that the map, has, again, has to be zero on this piece and non-zero on this piece. And so you find that uh, at sort of the representation theoretic interpretation of non-classical modular forms of classical weight is you, is uh, copies of negative weight Verma modules inside H1 tilde. And uh, so that's, and so the kind of, um, so the analysis of this dotted arrow is closely related to the analysis of what kind of Verma modules can appear inside H1 tilde. Positive weight Verma modules, negative weight Verma modules. So sort of interaction, so in fact, Roy Hellman and Shen have made it a sort of elaborate study of eigenvarieties kind of using the interaction between the sort of uh, geometric theory of category O and this dotted arrow. Um, but I wanted, so sorry Vesha, I'm not gonna get to the, your question, but I wanted to say, um, give one other example. There's, there's another context where, um, there's, so there's another context where you can see that um, something happens with this dotted arrow, which is if you look at the case of SL2, we have tempered endoscopy. And so... Uh, so if I, again, just let me be at sort of uh, tame level one. 
but go up the p-power level tower. But just replace everywhere kind of GL2 by SL2. Then we know that if you take a, so I'm, if I'm, I'm doing just p-power level, so I'd, I'd take a um, CM form just of conductor p. So for example, if uh, p were equal to 7, then you know, x0 49 gives you a CM form of 7 power conductor. But so, if you, so, so you know that for SL2, when you have uh, CM forms, uh, they're endoscopic for SL2. So what happens is that um, we have to be a little bit careful because I did the case I just gave my pi p is gemified. But, but rough, what, roughly, you know, so I have to be a little bit careful and I don't have much time. So what I'm going to say is that, uh, so let me, yeah, let me kind of add tame level so that I can think about um, so we have CM forms with P inert in the imaginary quadratic field that gives the CM then then uh, the pi p is an unramified principal series with AP equals zero and pi p restricted to SL2 breaks up as two, a direct sum of two pieces. So when you have an unramified principal series with AP equals zero, when you restrict to SL2, you break up into, into two pieces. What happens is that um, you take the spherical vector for SL2ZP, you multiply it by P, you act on it by P001, and P001 is not in SL2. And uh, for a typical unramified principal series, even though that second vector was obtained from the original spherical vector using a matrix not in SL2. Nevertheless, typically you can still get that to that spherical vector in a less obvious way using matrices in SL2. But when AP equals zero, you can't. And so the spherical vector generates one SL2 representation and P001 times the spherical vector generates just another SL2 representation and their direct sum altogether gives you this pi P. And what will happen is that if you, um, if you kind of fix what's happening away from p, if you kind of fix your local factor, your kind of local pi l's away from p, then only uh, one of these gadgets will appear in classical cohomology, but not both. So that's, so that's the phenomena in endoscopy of having an L packet, <laughs> but only part of the L packet actually being automorphic. And so, but when one looks at this kind of picture, again, you'll write down some induction which sees both of these objects. But only one of them will be allowed to map in a non-zero way into cohomology. And so, a version of Ding's argument will show that in completed cohomology, you get uh, a non-split extension of one Banach space completion of one of these by a Banach space completion of the other. And so, uh, so kind of endoscopy phenomena kind of cause interesting extension structures to appear inside eigenspaces of completed cohomology. Um, for SL2, yeah, for SL2. And so, um, so I should say that um, Christian Johansson and well, Judith Ludwig and then Johansson and Ludwig together studied kind of uh, endoscopy for um, SL2 kind of from a pers perspective of eigenvarieties. But my understanding is they kind of didn't really think, sort of focus so much on this question of what happens when AP equals zero. But I think, um, so well, well again, we know that the, 
the classical theory of endoscopy is related to studying residues of Eisenstein series and producing non-tempered representations, for example, as residues of Eisenstein series. And so I think the study of this kind of uh, this sort of periodic theory of eigen varieties and how it interacts with um, endoscopy is also a very interesting question, which is somehow not studied all that much. Um, partly because endoscopy is really a phenomena away from the group GLN, and most of the work on eigen varieties is for GLN. Um, and so, yeah, so actually the reason I wanted to give this talk is mainly to kind of advertise the idea that the sort of theory of eigen varieties looks a lot like the theory of Eisenstein series. And the question of the singularities of Eisenstein series is one of the basic interesting questions at the kind of beginning of the theory of automorphic forms. And uh, I think, um, although a lot of, you know, a huge amount is known for Eigen varieties in the, in the elaborate theory, I think uh, there's sort of more to be understood. And especially sort of the, the sort of argument of, of Dings and, and generalizing it has, um, I think, there are a lot of possible applications, especially in, the, in sort of, sort of whenever you have, yeah, so, so sort of this, whenever you have um, a kind of forbidden, when it, whenever you know that some piece of a principal series can't map into cohomology, that forces the jordan holder coefficients of the principal series to be arranged in some interesting way inside cohomology. That's just what happens in, in the theory of Eisenstein series, and, uh, yeah, and I'd like to kind of encourage people to, to sort of think about that. I think it's an interesting question, especially for groups away from GLM. So anyway, thank you for your patience and listening. There are other questions for the speaker? So I'm a little confused about this dotted arrow. I mean, you said it came from some version of a joint nest, but wouldn't that give you an honest morphism? I'm not sure why you why the arrow is dotted. Because um, well, because it's a theorem I proved, which is kind of a partial adjunction between the local linear Jacquet module and, and parabolic induction, but it, the but there's not a true adjunction. There's really an arrow that exists only in certain situations, and uh, essentially, what you need is um. You basically need to assume that. You, you, have this, you have this kind of character chi and it generates a, um, a Verma module and you need to basically assume that all the um, non-dominant, if chi is, you, you, you sort of need to, so chi generates some Verma module, so there's kind of the co of that Verma module and then there's everything below the co -suckle. You need to assume that the, everything below the co somehow doesn't appear like, like, like the character chi produces a finite slope vector. So you just need to assume that that finite slope vector does not, that the thing it generates does not contain anything below the co of of that Verma module. And then you get the dotted arrow. So the dotted arrow kind of um, is basically some I mean, Vilu Vishig type theorem that thickens up that co of the Verma module to an entire local, to an entire set of sub quotient of a local elite principal series. But you need to assume that some of the subquotients, the ones that will be sitting below the co-cycle, are not mapping in. So it's um, so this uh, so so to kind to kind of fill in the dots, you at the chi that are bad. So Broy proved to related to jointness. So you have to replace the local the principal series by a all x jauk representation, which is exactly some other kind of uh, locally analytic thickening of a of a Verma module. Um, and so the kind of um, this, so the kind of theory of all x jack representations gives you the language to talk about what happens at the singularities of the dotted arrow. Which um, representation? Uh, so called all x jack representations. Let me. Yeah. <coughs> so these all x jack representations are. They're, um, they're kind of cousins of locally analytic parabolic inductions, but they're more general sort of related objects that are built, that are kind of modeled on category O. So in a way, a locally analytic parabolic induction is kind of a locally analytic cousin of a contragredient verbal module in category O. And then, uh, for example, the thing that was happening at a 
non-classical, at a classical weight, but non-classical modular form, it produces some Olick's Jack representation, which is a cousin of an honest Verma module. So it has a kind of finite dimensional algebraic thing in the co circle rather than in the suckle. Um, and then there's sort of other, I mean, in, well, for GL2, there are not so many possibilities because Verma modules for GL2 are not so complicated, but for higher rank groups, there are kind of more possibilities for these Olick Jack representations. Mm -hmm. Can you use this map to study the uh, zeros of the periodic zeta functions? Yeah, I, s I think. Um, it's a good question, and I think it's sort of... So early in the theory of kind of eigen, the eigencurve, uh, so Belayish, another sadly departed kind of young, brilliant young number theorist, um, Belayish and Chenevier studied the, um, the behavior of the eigencurve at critical like an evil Eisenstein series. And it's related to the behavior of the periodic zeta functions. And it's also definitely related to this map in some way. But I don't understand sort of exactly how systematic this is. But I think, um, yeah, I, I, mean, I think sort of using, I mean, of course, you also know that sort of the use of, say, non tamponetoscopy in periodic modular forms, but in a more classical language is, is how uh, Skinner and Abans and also Belay and Chevier studied the main conjecture. So, of course, one hope would be that kind of studying this representation theory and connecting it to sort of non-tempered endoscopy will give different perspectives, a more representation theoretic perspective on the use of endoscopy in the theory, in Iwasawa theory. But, but I don't, um, I mean, of course, that's a fantasy. And that's one reason I'd be interested in this question. But I don't have anything kind of very good to say about it. Yeah, I have a closely related question. So th this phenomenon, of course, is detected by the periodic L function at the time the uh, mm -hmm. it computes the extension. So is there anything, uh, I didn't know about this phenomenon. So is there anything that the periodic L function sees related to that? No, I think, um, I think the extension class is, is unique. And so there's not really an inv so that you get an onclude extension. There's not really an invariant. I'm not sure what this. I'm not sure what this uh, extension that's happening in H1 tilde. I'm not sure what number theory you could extract from it, if anything. Um, I, th I th think it's kind of an interesting phenomena. But I would. But you might hope that in um, that in more elaborate situations you get sort of more interesting extension classes where there's a possibility of different extension classes and you get a particular one that has some significance. Um, thank you.